This is another in a short series of videos where we look at some of the practical activities that we use for school visits when students either at Key Stage 4 or post-16 visit the undergraduate teaching laboratories at the University of Bristol. In this experiment we're going to synthesize benzocaine, a solid anesthetic. Benzocaine is an ester made by the esterification of 4-amino benzoic acid with ethanol using concentrated sulfuric acid as a catalyst. Here we will look at weighing the use of reflux for providing the energy for a reaction that involves volatile materials, how we remove the catalyst from the reaction mixture, Buckner filtration or reduced pressure filtration, some analysis techniques of thin layer chromatography, the use of melting point apparatus, and finally analysis via infrared spectroscopy. To start the experiment, we need to weigh out our starting materials that are not in excess. In the round bottom flask, we already have the ethanol a reagent in excess and its catalyst concentrated sulfuric acid. Or 4-amino benzoic acid is the reagent that isn't in excess, so it needs to be accurately weighed if we're going to perform a percentage yield. To start, we weigh the small container that contains the 4-amino benzoic acid. We then empty this container into our reaction vessel and weigh the empty container. The difference in the weights leads us to the mass of 4-amino benzoic acid we actually have in the reaction. The method of reflux is often employed in organic chemical reactions. In organic chemistry, it's a faster rate of reaction than organic chemistry. In general terms, reflux allows us to heat up volatile materials or reactions that produce volatile products in a situation that doesn't allow any volatile materials to leave the reaction vessel. The vertical condenser simply delivers the condensed vapor back into the reaction mixture. We're using a heating mantle here rather than a Bunsen flame. Volatile materials used in organic chemistry tend to begin flammable. The heating mantle is also fitted with a magnetic stirrer which we're not using in this situation. A heating mantle also can be connected to a computer to heat up a reaction mixture at different temperatures over differing periods. The heating mantle also allows a more controlled heating to take place. The position where the condensation takes place in the condenser should not be any higher than two-thirds the way up the column. Otherwise you're likely to lose vapour out of the column. You can get condensers which are longer than the ones that we have employed here if high temperature reflux is required. If you notice, there is an additional piece to a normal heating mantle that surrounds the lower half of the round bottom flask to make sure heat is delivered more evenly. You should note that many diagrams for reflux in textbooks tend to be wrong. There should only be one clamp engaged in the apparatus and that is secures the neck of the reaction vessel. The condenser merely sits into the top of the reaction vessel. And this makes it easier to remove once the reaction is complete. You've only got one clamp to move to remove the reaction vessel from the heating mantle. In the laboratory that we're using here, we have a chilled water supply permanently connected up to a condenser so we don't have to worry about using taps that may cause flooding. Once the reflux has been completed, and remember the time for reflux has been calculated by numerous previous experiments, we can then proceed to let the reaction mixture cool down, ready for the next step. So at the end of the reflux, the reaction mixture we now have contains some of our desired product, the benzocaine. We will of course have unreacted amino benzoic acid and ethanol. Organic reactions very rarely tend to go to 100%. We'll have some water within our starting reagents and of course as a product of esterification, a product of the reaction. And because we're using a catalyst, in this case sulfuric acid, catalysts don't get used up in the reaction so we've got that as well. Once the reactant mixture has finished its reflux and has been allowed to cool, we now need to get rid of the catalyst. Catalysts, in this case concentrated sulfuric acid, don't get used up during a reaction. 
So we're going to neutralize the sulfuric acid using sodium carbonate solution. Our reaction mixture is poured into a measured volume of sodium carbonate and is left to react. Acid plus carbonate makes salt plus water plus carbon dioxide. We need to check that the solution is no longer acidic, so we're going to use pH paper, universal indicator paper. A common mistake of using universal indicator paper is to dip the paper into the solution. This, of course, would release some of the dyes that are present in the paper into the reaction mixture and make it harder to separate. We simply transfer some of the reactant mixture to the paper and check on its pH and decide whether or not we need to use more sodium carbonate to neutralize any sulfuric acid that remains. Swirling, of course, ensures a complete mixture to remove all the sulfuric acid present in the solution. The next step will be filtration. Let's take a look at the filtration stage. It's rare to employ gravity filtration in a laboratory. Gravity filtration would be where you take a round filter paper, fold it into quadrants, put it into a funnel, and pass the solution through the filter paper. It's not that it doesn't work, it just takes too long. What we tend to use is Buckner filtration or vacuum filtration. To do this, we need a Buckner funnel, which is a ceramic piece of apparatus with some holes in the bottom. And there are filter papers that are manufactured to specifically fit into these Buckner funnels. The Buckner funnel itself would be placed into a sidearm conical flask with a thick wall connected via a rubber gasket. And in turn, this would be connected to a vacuum pump or a water pump. Here we're using a vacuum pump. To operate a Buckner funnel correctly, the funnel should be in an apparatus that is clamped for stability. The filter paper is wet with the solvent in use. In this particular case, we're using water. This stops any insoluble material passing under the filter paper before the vacuum gets into full swing. We pass the mixture through the dampened filter paper into the funnel, which is already under vacuum, and we rinse out the flask with cold distilled water, our solvent, to ensure maximum yield. Chilled distilled water will dissolve less of our product than warm distilled water, and we're trying to maximize yield. We also use ice chilled distilled water to wash our sample. The damp sample of the original mixture will contain a solution which has impurities in it which we don't want crystallizing out. So we replace that dampness of that solution with distilled water. We then need to dry our sample. The first stage is a very rough one. We simply pass air through the Buckner funnel for a few minutes and then we take our sample to a drying cabinet. And drying cabinet is maintained at around 60 degrees centigrade well below the melting point of any sample that is to be dried. Of course, if you wanted to ensure it was dry, you'd weigh this damp sample beforehand, put it into the drying cabinet and weigh it periodically until the mass no longer decreases. We dry to constant mass. The next step is some analysis of our product. So just a quick recap, the mixture we now have at the end of the filtration will be our damp product. Uh, we can dry it out in a drying cabinet. We don't yet know whether the product is pure or still contains traces of impurities. One way of looking at the purity of the product formed in this synthesis is to use thin layer chromatography, which gets abbreviated to TLC. The TLC plate that is used contains alumina that has been treated with a fluorescer. The alumina itself is stuck either on the back of a plastic or aluminium support material. When handling a TLC plate, it's best to hold it by its edges so you don't transfer any contaminants to the face. To mark up a TLC plate, pencil, not ink pen, must be used. Draw a straight line to mark the position where you're going to apply the samples under test. Make up some solutions of the samples under test. Here we're going to make a solution of pure benzocaine and the benzocaine produced in the reaction. We dissolve up small amounts of our sample into an appropriate solvent such as ethyl ethanoate. We use a capillary tube to apply small amounts of the solvent-solute mixture to the markings on the plate. 
we put several layers one on top of each other and try and make the spot as small as possible. We don't want large blobs because it leads to inaccuracy if we were doing measuring of RF values. Before we run the TLC we put the plate under an ultraviolet light. Because the sample applied has covered over the fluorescer it appears as a dark spot against a green fluorescing background. You can also check there are no impurities elsewhere on the plate at this point. The plate then needs to be put in a sealable jar with some appropriate solvent. The solvent mixture is ethyl ethanoate with cyclohexane in it. Ensure that the solvent level starts below the pencil line, otherwise the mixture will simply dissolve into the solvent. After a while the solvent mixture passes up through the alumina of the TLC plate and depending on the intermolecular bonding of your samples it will progress up the plate at different rates. And we stop the TLC before the solvent front gets to the top of the plate. As soon as the solvent front gets near to the top of the plate we unscrew the jar, take out our sample and immediately mark the position of the solvent front. If you wait more than a few seconds it will start evaporating and you won't know exactly where the solvent has got to. We would need to know where the solvent has got to if we were making calculations of RF values. The plate is then left to dry and put back under the ultraviolet light and the positions of where the spots have moved is marked. If the product contained a mixture we would see a dot for each component. If the product was not benzocaine the dot or small circle would not be exactly in the same position as the pure benzocaine sample it was run against. TLC plates tend to be sharp and so they should be disposed of in a sharps waste bin. A balance is a must have in any science laboratory. A standard chemistry laboratory balance would weigh to 0 0.01 grams but balances far more accurate than this exist. The balance you see here is a top pan balance measuring to 0 0.01 grams. The balances must be set up on a surface that is flat. Some balances have a spirit level built in to ensure that the balance is level. The balance should be away from any vibration so a solid bench top is usually fine. But of course you've got to watch out for drafts from nearby windows. Drafts affect the way that the balance works and will give you a less accurate measurement. Chemicals should never be weighed directly onto the pan of the balance. They should always be weighed into a container first. A lot of laboratory balances have a tearing mechanism that allows you to zero the balance, to tear the balance. If you place a container on a balance that is empty, you can tear it to zero and add the mass required. That makes calculations unnecessary and removes one point of error. Avoid any spillages on the balance itself. If there are some, they should be wiped clean. Avoid making dust. Dust in a laboratory is not a good thing. When weighing a product into a sample tube, a quick method is to tap the product onto a piece of filter paper that has a sharp crease down it and use that as a chute to put into the container. However, this actually does leave behind some small amounts of your product onto the filter paper. If you want to be more precise about this, you should be using a weighing boat. Always check that you've left the balance clean once you're finished with it. Infrared spectroscopy is another analytical tool that can help us identify materials that we have made. Infrared radiation causes the covalent bonds in molecules to vibrate. Each type of covalent bond will use up a particular wave number or the energy associated with that wave number to cause vibration or stretching modes. A molecule is only a collection of bonds. In a synthesis, the starting material will have one infrared spectrum. Its product will be very similar, but one bond or another will have been used up and new bonds created as we change the functional groups that are present. To use an infrared spectrometer, the first thing we need to do is to clean the diamond that is used as the window into the machine. And we can use the, effectively a baby wet wipe for this. We can use propan 2 -ol. We then let the diamond dry off, which is very quick as it, propan 2 is very volatile. We also clean the mirror that is used to reflect the radiation back through the sample. Before we run a sample, we do a background test 
we simply let the infrared spectrometer know the air that we are using, which happens to be the air in the laboratory. The software allows this spectrum of air to be removed from the sample. Of course, between sample crystals, there will be some air trapped. When this is done, we put a small amount of our product under test onto the diamond, screw down the mirror, and set the spectrometer off. The spectrometer here is usually set to run four scams, remove any anomalies, and remove the spectrum of air. We can use the infrared spectrometer to run both the sample of product and the starting material so that comparisons can be made between the two spectra. The spectra can be printed off or saved to a memory stick or to the student's file space. Always clean up the spectrometer after use. It's only a poor chemist that leaves chemicals unlabeled in a laboratory, even if it's small sample. The purity of benzocaine can be assessed through its melting point. Pure materials tend to have sharp melting points, where impure materials have a melting point range. Now, this is not always the case. Some pure compounds have a melting point range as well. There are many different types of melting point apparatus, but they all are essentially a heating mantle to which a thermometer is attached. This may be a thermocouple in the case of a digital readout. The first step is to get some of the solid into a very thin capillary tube that's sealed at one end. Any damp product will not tap into a capillary tube. If a product is suspected of being damp, it should be dried out in a drying cabinet for at least half an hour. You need a five to six millimeter height of your product. The capillary tube then fits into the heating block. And most machines allow you to run multiple samples at any one time. This particular melting point apparatus allows you to ramp up or quickly speed up the time it takes to heat to just a few degrees below your expected target and then to slow the heating to be able to get a more precise melting point. One simply looks through the, the lens, through the window of the apparatus, and judges when the solid becomes liquid, and make a note of the melting point. Used capillary tubes are considered sharps and should be disposed of in a sharps waste bucket. Or bin. So we have weighed out our starting materials on which we're going to base our percentage yield calculations. We've heated up under reflux, we've removed the catalyst and separated out some of the other impurities by filtering out our insoluble product. We've dried it and we've analyzed it through thin layer chromatography, melting point and by infrared spectroscopy.